But there's going to be a little bit of time for us to, uh, you're going to be raising your hands a lot, so I'm sorry if, you're, if your arms get tired, but here's what we're going to talk about today. So some of you guys saw the title of this, and it has to do with the Internet of Things, right? So wearables, mobile, and you might think that that's going to be some high-level, deep conversation about these new technologies and how we can track them passively, and that's actually not the case. We're going to dummy this down to some really basic things that go along with tracking new technologies. I appreciated uh, Michael's talk about all the trends going on. This is another just layer on top of that is this is a real trend. So if you don't take anything else out of this talk, take away that there's a real trend going on here, or at least a change going on, that you have to know enough about to at least stay in the business. Um, how many people, are we good with this? I'm trying to change some slides here. I can direct you guys to change slides if that's helpful. Wait. It's going to be great, guys. Don't worry. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, there we go. Hey, does anybody, anybody anybody recognize this picture? Three years ago, Do you guys know who this is. This is Steve Ballmer, Microsoft guy. Probably read about him a few times, but he he's an emotional guy. So getting a picture of him crying is not that big a deal. You can go YouTube his like farewell speech from Microsoft. It's quite comical actually. He cries the entire time and. He sings Time of Your Life and almost jumps off the stage. It's, it's really funny, but that's not the point of this picture. The point of this picture, if you guys remember, this was three years ago. Nokia announced that they were going to have a $7, $7 billion exit from their smartphone division to sell to Microsoft. Well, Steve Ballmer, you think, would be happy about that, but he was on the managing director board of Nokia, and they had these big plans about their smartphone division. And if you guys remember the quote that came out about three years ago, it was from uh, Stephen Elip, their Nokia's uh, CEO, that said, at the very end of the meeting, as he's walking off, he says, I don't, we did nothing wrong, but we lost anyway. And so that, in, and this ensued, right? So this is Steve Ballmer's reaction to this. He's on the board, and everybody's saying, we didn't do anything wrong. We actually built a really good company. A lot of you guys in here have really good businesses going. But then you go on to read the commentary about this, and the point was, we did nothing wrong. But we lost anyway. They lost anyway because they didn't see some of the trends that were coming and changing around them. It's not that they screwed up. Actually, in most cases, when you guys analyze your business in cases where you feel like you've been in valleys of your business, rarely is it because you did something black and white wrong. It's just because maybe you didn't keep up fast enough or somebody else was a little bit more aggressive or to the panel's last point, maybe somebody just got a lot of money and beat you to the punch. So going with that in mind... Um, Oh, I was going backwards with the button. Just a little self-admittance, I was going backwards with the button. That's why it wasn't working earlier. Sorry about that. So, field agent, six years ago, I was sitting in a room. I'd been working for a company for five or six years. They said, hey, let's start this thing. And, hey, Mark, do you want to help out? And I was fortunate enough that this thing actually worked out. But the point was, we didn't do this because we thought we could make money. I'm sure that was in the back of our heads. But we saw times changing. You heard Mark talk about in 2007 when the smartphone was coming out. 2009 is when the iPhone was really becoming something to stand in line for. And now it seems as part of us, an extension of our hand, basically, as uh, some of you guys are experiencing every day with your teenage children, I'm sure. So um, Field Agent started because of this idea that we didn't want to have our heads in the sand with our research company, or our heads in our hands with our research company saying, why didn't we get ahead of something? So we launched an app in 2000. In nine, and we said, hey, we're going to gather all these people from all around the country. We're going to be the first app in the app store that actually pays you, that you don't have to pay for or just get points or badges or whatever with. We're going to actually pay people cash to gather information for us while they're out in the field. Well, luckily, we had a few clients that liked that idea, paid us some money. We got started. And uh, you can hear more about Field Agent more if you want to talk to us afterwards in the booth. But the idea was we didn't want to get behind. Now, another thing we don't want to get behind on is this topic of today, and that's the Internet of Things. So, Big topic came out. Pick your conference that it came out in two or three years ago on how toasters are going to talk to each other and whatever it might be. But the point was that there's all this connectivity, and the Internet of Things is all about data sharing a, a, amongst a network with different appliances, objects, phones, watches. I'm going to go through a few examples here in a, in a minute. But we as researchers at least have to have an opinion on the research methodology we're going to do about all these interconnected things. things. I'm of the same mindset as the panel you heard up here, too, about a fear of passive data collection to an extent. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about us being aware of the types of devices and things that are out there so that we know what consumers are trying, 
we know what clients are wanting to understand behavior about. So let me go through a few examples. I'm going to ask you guys to an extent to kind of raise your hand if you own or have experienced any of these things so that we just get a feel for inside the office. Who knows what this is? Google Glass, right? So you're like, wait a minute, that thing failed. So go read the Google Glass website. You'll know that they're not producing it right now, but they're saying, wait till you see what's next. But the point is, this is some type of wearable technology, some type of an augmented reality technology that connects to some type of network or some type of device in order to change your vision on things. There were plenty of reasons on why people thought this was a little bit scary for people to walk around in public or uh, restrooms or uh, changing rooms or whatever. Pick your uh, event that, that caused people to get scared of this technology, but eyewear, wearable eyewear, connected wearable eyewear is not going to go away. There's still other companies making this and that it's coming out in. So some of you guys have heard this. Anybody actually own a pair of wearable type glasses like this? Yeah. Okay. I didn't think so. Okay. How about this? If you do, then you guys need to get up here and flex for us or something, because people that own this stuff, this is hardcore training type stuff. This is like you're signing $160 million deals as a quarterback in the NFL or something. So this is, uh, this is, just, this is another wearable sensor-based type technology. So you guys go watch some videos on this. There's a company called Athos out there that has a wearable technology that this is all about enhancing the performance of how people train. So think about this, right? If I can monitor heart rate, and if I can monitor movements, and if I can monitor patterns, just like the guy that wants to improve his golf swing nowadays, all he needs is a good mobile app, it'll tell you what you're doing wrong, how you're performing, and how you're not. So another wearable technology example. Let's keep going. You guys know what this is? Oculus Rift. If you don't know what this is, you need to experience this. It kind of freaks you out, actually. So here's a good example. Have anybody ever worn an Oculus? Okay, great. So, and I'm talking about like the, the, the Oculus. And, and there are some good little cardboard things you can put your phone in that are really cool too. We'll talk about those in a minute. So here's a good example of an Oculus experiment. And there's actually great ones out there of people experiencing this. So I suggest that you look them up. But so one of the Oculus experiments is you put these glasses on and all of a sudden it has convinced you that you're standing on top of uh, the tallest ledge and you're at the edge of it and then people are trying to talk you into stepping forward like I would right now. Actually, let's do it like this because it would really just be like I'm stepping forward right here, totally safe. Rarely anybody can actually step forward. That's how realistic it is. You can convince yourself, I know I'm standing on carpet, I know it's flat in front of me, I can kind of feel it with my foot, but everything in my reality tells me that I'm gonna fall off that cliff, it's amazing. Those things connect, they share data. They bring data in. Consumers are using them. They're trying them. You know, researchers are using the, this technology to actually simulate the effects of, uh, of an over-the-counter medication or a pharmaceutical or somebody that has struggled with. Uh, uh, there's a great one on, on the website, I think, for Excedrin that uh, talks about how people that have struggled with migraines have actually made technology like this help people experience migraineous type effects so that their family members can feel sorry for them, basically, when you watch the video. It's actually quite heartfelt. I, I'm a migraine guy, so I have a little bit of uh, sympathy for it. Now let's get some more hands up. Smart watches. Doesn't have to be an Apple watch. Smart watches. Okay. So more people in the room have a smart watch. This is one of the bigger, more adopted. Uh, this would probably be a further down the scale on Michael's presentation about it kind of being beyond a trend, arguable on whether it was as big as we wanted it to be or not, but that's another one. Let's keep going. We're going to move through this. Okay, CarPlay. Anybody have a car with Apple CarPlay in it? Okay. So, do you like it? So, you love it, right? Just help me out here. So, um, no, no, what, how many of you guys at least three or four years ago thought, why can't my phone just show up on my dashboard, right? I actually thought about it, uh, TMI, I'm sure, but I actually thought about why can't my phone just show up in the shower so that I can like play around with things while I'm, while I'm in my daily routine, right? So um, we, th this is something where Apple said, we can do this. Let's work, with, let's work with some cars. Guess what? This connects to things that shares data about what you're doing, just like everything else does. Internet of things is not this complicated uh, idea. These are the things that we all know. This is a concept. Uh, you read enough Mac rumors websites, you're going to see stuff like this. But the point is not a concept. So this is the washing Mac machine, right? So that it's not a real thing. Apple's not producing washing machines, and so far they're not producing TVs or cars. But we'll see how that goes. The point was, you know what the, the you know what the point I'm trying to make here about washing machines is. There's actually washing machines out there now that know when they're low on detergent and they connect to order you more detergent. How many of you guys in the research industry would want to know somebody's personal behavior on whether they're going to go to the store or just let their washing machine order for them? 
It's a big difference. And their behavior is going to change. And on a survey that they did a store intercept for, they may have said, I'm going to go buy washing detergent because, honestly, they've forgotten that their washing machine orders it for them. Um, it changes behavior. This changes a lot of behavior. How many people have some kind of connected home device? Anything, even a thermostat, garage door opener, alarm system. Yeah, usually we're getting into a lot more adoption right there. So uh, this is integrated inside the entire home. A little bit scary too. So some of you guys have alarm systems with connected home cameras and you're always scared whether someone can hack into those and see into my living room or something like that. But the point is, this stuff's connected. It's connected to your network at home. If your power goes out, if your Wi-Fi goes out, we're all kind of screwed when it comes to all the things that we connect to inside of our home. Um, let's keep going. Have you guys seen this fridge from Samsung? $4,500, it's yours today. So uh, it was $5,000 marked down at Home Depot for $4,500. You guys can order it right now. Um, see that picture of that phone over there? That's not just some cool graphic I pulled up. That is actually a streaming into the camera that's inside the fridge so that you can see what you have in stock. Oh, it doesn't just do that. I had a video, but I didn't think we'd have time. Um, to where you can actually mark the, the, the days old of certain items on that touchpad over there so that it can then connect to a pantry feature that it has to reorder for you. Kind of scary, right? Actually, we don't even wrap our heads around this stuff, so we just avoid it. But the point is, there are all these smart appliances now that say, we can make your life easier. And some people are saying it actually works. So changing behavior, right? How about this? Anybody have an Amazon Dash button? Yeah? Which one? OK, yeah. So I, I probably should be careful with questions I ask, right? They have some of these buttons for things that you guys probably wouldn't scream out in a room. But the point being, I don't know, there's hundreds of these now. Everybody know, if you don't know what Amazon Dash is, just look it up. It's, you get a chance to go in your Amazon app, you buy one of these buttons, and it's right next to, um, it's right next to, let's say Gatorade, for example, is next to your fridge. You know you always reorder a certain type of Gatorade. Push the button, it orders automatically from Amazon Prime. You get it in two days. And so the, you get to program kind of one item per button type deal, and then you get a rebate on the button when you order for your first order, so it doesn't actually cost you anything net-net. Now, will this go into mass adoption? I don't know. There'll be certain items that it might, but the point is consumer behavior is changing. So here's the point with Field Agent and Connected where we cared about. So we, we could have spun our wheels. We, we actually have a strategy team. We're not that big, but we decided to have a strategy team. Everybody else has a strategy team, so we put some people on it and said we need a strategy team. And so with a strategy team, we could have come up with ways to passively track all these mainstream devices that you'd see. But you know what all these things have in common? Is that smartphone down at the bottom. All of these things connect into your device. And so one just tidbit I would give you guys is as you try to look into how all these things are interconnected, at least for a season, it's going to connect via your smart device, iPhone, Android. Spend your time researching people on their smart device. I know that's why you're here. But my point being, don't think that that didn't limit you in connecting to these other devices, because these other devices are already connected to the phone. So do you have to have some integrated SDK app into the Samsung refrigerator app? No, you don't. You just need to connect to the consumer who's using their phone both to order groceries and to talk to you about their experience. That's the way we've approached it at Field Agent for now. It's a simplified version of how you connect into technology, but I think what it does is it covers the whole gamut of what you might see. A couple things. Why do people freely engage with text? tech? Well, this is completely normal now. Most of you guys know most of these logos. If you don't, maybe some of the newer ones down here is like a Vine or a Periscope down here, the bottom two. If you guys don't know what that is, it's basically cool now to show people exactly what you're doing unfiltered. So Vine, Periscope, um, uh, Facebook Live now, right? So you can actually do these things that you, <laughs> you're actually OK saying. Let's see, so instead of the 17 selfies to get the perfect one, you're actually recording yourself live and you have a chance to fall on your face. But that's normal behavior now. So normal behavior now is sharing everything with everybody. It's not normal for me. I'm only 32 years old, but my wife says I'm like 50, so I don't do this stuff as much. But this is normal behavior for everybody else. So posting something on Instagram for everybody to see what you were doing is not abnormal. So the way you respond to research on a mobile device and you think it's going to be weird to ask somebody about some personal habit, it's not. It's not weird anymore. So any of you that still have this notion that it's not okay to interact with certain people on their device in certain ways, there's barely limits anymore because people have opened themselves up to a limitless world of sharing. So we can take advantage of that as 
weird as it may feel to ask people about certain things or to ask them to document certain things via their mobile device, they're doing it anyway. They're just sharing with their friends. Now you give them a couple bucks, they'll share with you. There's nothing, there's nothing new to them to avoid, and there's no reason to lie about it. Field Agent takes that same approach. We're a crowdsourcing platform that utilizes smart devices to collect fast, reliable information at the point of influence. That doesn't tell you anything other than we do a lot of mobile research and insights at the point of influence. We're all about geolocation. We're all about quality control, making sure people are in the area they said they were and that they're behaving in the most natural way possible when we collect information. Uh, we collect information. None of this terminology is new for you guys, but we look at things, whether it's either zero moment of truth, pre-purchase, first moment of truth, which is at the shelf, or second moment of truth, which is after experience. I'm just going to go through a few examples, and then we'll wrap up here and have a break. I'm trying to fly through this. But, so here's, here's a good example. We, here's a great example of how are we going to do research on the Internet of Things. So remember when I said just be a part of this and know that it's going on? Well, we said the same thing a year ago. So what are we going to do? We, so we have a panel, hundreds of thousands of people. Let's see what they're already doing. So I could go into the 20 slide deck we have, but I just pulled up a few images here. So here's a good example. We ask people basically, what technology do you find appeal appealing? Well, in this case, we were talking about the connected aisle. You guys remember a couple years ago when GE Lighting and others were working together to say we're going to put beacons everywhere and then consumers had a little bit of pushback about always being bombarded in their phone, and we're still really trying to figure out what that means. Are beacons going to be the next RFID chip, or are they going to do more? And we'll figure it out, but the point was we just asked people what they thought about the connected aisle. So in other words, specifically getting a message on your phone that has some kind of deal or information on it during your shopping trip. 27% found this appealing. Not quite as many as I would have thought. So we go on. What about replenishment? What about your appliances in your house being smart enough, your Amazon Dash button? Replenishment through the Internet of Things. 48% found this appealing. Connected home, 27%. That's not true. It's 72%. So that's backwards. Just trust me on this. 72% found that appealing. It looks like I just did a copy and paste issue there. The point was, you can see how kind of the less invasive and the more you kind of get to control and the easier to understand. Nest is pretty easy to understand, right? If you guys have a Nest system, you twirl the little thing till it's the temperature you want, or you go on your app and twirl the little thing till it's the temperature you want. At my washing machine ordering detergent for me scares me a little bit. You bombarding me with messages in the store, I don't know if I like that. So you get to see kind of a, the scale of how, how things are going through um, this process. So that's zero moment of truth, right? Those were all the things that were, I haven't bought anything yet. I, we, just want to, we just want to see what people are thinking. Would you like this experience? There's no first moment of truth yet on whether they're going to they're actually go to the store or not. So first moment of truth example. So when, with this Beacon in-store test, we actually asked shoppers to interact with Beacons. Why not? There were already Beacons in certain stores, so we thought we'd take advantage of that. Actually increased the amount of travel into the aisles by 26 points versus those that didn't interact with the Beacon. So we were telling people to go into departments or areas of the store, and then certain aisles got traveled 26 points more if there was some message that popped up unbeknownst to them that it was going to pop up to prompt them to go into the aisle. They were also more willing to access uh, mobile messages in, a be in the Beacon in-store test than we actually thought. So the zero moment of truth made us think nobody's really going to want this when they actually experienced it, and it didn't bombard them, which you're going to see down here. They were willing to accept three to four messages during a large shopping trip. We actually saw their compliance go up. So that was the first moment of truth. Here's what we thought based upon research. Here's what actually happened when we got into the store. So another example of uh, maybe a first moment of truth, uh, Target launched a store in, or has a store in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Anybody from Minnetonka in here? So, um, hey, yeah. so you know what they have? They have an entire Internet of Things section that they're testing. This is a first moment of truth. They're wanting to see if consumers will find a specific area in the store that's all about your connected home, your connected appliances, your connected technologies. Uh, appealing enough for them to give that kind of shelf space to it. So they're trying it out. I mean, this is a trend, or at least a potential trend that we're seeing come. So even Target is saying, I'm going to put an entire department or section within a department that just goes over educating consumers on the options they have for the Internet of Things. Here's another test we did. We, uh, we were testing with some consumers on a specific, do you guys know you can, you can there's like connected crock pots? 
I mean, that kind of makes sense, right? So um, I'm cooking something. Normally, you got to leave church early to go turn it off or some kind of old cliche like that. But in this case, go onto your app and it'll show you kind of what the temperature it's cooking at is and how long it's been, and you decide whether to turn your crock pot off or not. So we did a study in the second moment of truth, actual usage. Get people that had these crock pots, or we had people purchase them, or we sent them, depending on the example that we're talking through, and said, how did this experience go? Did you use it? What did you think? And so with the connected appliances, with something like this, we found that people's idea of whether an appliance should order for you or not, or kind of be your brains, whether a refrigerator or a, a, a washing machine should order for you, was a little less adopted. Well, what was more adopted, as you can imagine, is I want to turn my crock pot off and I don't want to have to go home to do it. Well, that's still internet of things. It's still connected. It still changes consumer behavior. So um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of wrap up. Hope I got through this quick enough. But the point was just to really spur on a little bit of thought. There are devices, technologies, and things you're either just... You either keep up with the right blog so that you hear about them, or you're going to see a neighbor or somebody around you doing this. You're going to be like Michael traveling around, and he said, I see a lot more people wearing these funny glasses now. Or what are those bumps underneath that guy's shirt for him to, what well, he's monitoring his heart rate? Or what about these, these cars look a little bit cooler now? Or I, I went over to my friend's house, and she was playing Pandora through a refrigerator which that's pretty common nowadays. So um, what's going on? These things are all interconnected. So my, my advice actually is for now, don't try to figure out where, where the heck all this data is going and congregate it, because I'll tell you right now, there's not this great supplier out there that's aggregating all Internet of Things data in a big database for you to pull off of. Know that everything comes back to your mobile device for people to interact with this. So focus there. It's why we're here today. Focus on mobile. Don't forget that there are things out there that you might not interact with every day, but they're happening. Consumers are using them. They're trying them. They're OK turning their crock pot off from the grocery store. They're OK getting in a car that looks like their iPhone. They, they actually like getting a message about something because of their uh, home security system at home. And so these things are happening. If you're not researching them, you're missing part of the population that's adopting newer technology. So know about it. Grow with it. You know, kind of last remarks is don't be like, this situation where you're saying five years from now, I wish I would have just opened my eyes a little bit to the technology around me. Some people have passed me by. So that's what I have for you guys today.